be motivated to do something while you're in that motivational phase, you build good habits. And with those habits, there's going to be a day where you just don't feel motivated. Like I didn't feel motivated today. I woke up 20 minutes late, you know, but I was on time because I set my clock 30 minutes before I need to be somewhere, but I had to rush. Wasn't into it, but got it done anyway. You know, that, that's probably going to be a majority of your workouts. You just don't feel motivated to do them, but you do them anyway. That's when you know you have created some discipline in your life. All right, guys, I'm going to let that one go now. I'm still working on that article, so kind of a little bit all over the place. But in the end, it comes down to investing in yourself. Right? You don't have to do money. Don't even have to do a whole lot of time. Just invest in yourself to be 1% better than you were yesterday. Um, all right. So if you guys over here on Instagram want to ask any questions, um, I'm taking questions. Um, I see nobody's asking questions over there yet. Got some questions over here on my YouTube channel. Um, do you allow music, you guys, to train listening to music? If they're working out with me, I don't like people to be listening to music because I'm talking, right? If you're not tuned in to what I'm saying and how I'm training, um, I, I don't think that's very healthy. Um, you're just going to miss a lot, especially if I'm giving tips or training techniques and things like that that, that you're going to miss. So it depends. If you want to listen to music on your long runs, I don't care. Um, you know, whatever floats your boat. But if you're if you're around a group, the last thing you want to do is be tuned out of that group because um, that group is it's about you building rapport with that group as well. Like I I don't want anybody not communicating with each other in the middle of sets or throughout sets or spotting somebody, you know, not really paying attention. So that answer is it kind of depends on the situation. I feel if people are informed themselves about weighing out their macros throughout the day, they'd find out they eat a lot of stuff that they don't regularly. Yes, you are completely right. Like put it this way. If you're not assessing, you're just guessing whether that is with fitness tests or max reps weight, you know, you don't know if you have a weakness if you're not testing all these elements of fitness, right? You don't know if you're eating too much if you're not gauging what you are eating. That's something I definitely do is just write down everything that goes in my mouth. And then at the end of, you know, a couple of weeks, I can – either maintain weight, I can gain weight, or I can lose weight. I can look back and say, oh yeah, hmm, you know, that extra scoop of peanut butter, or, you know, I went out to eat, you know, three times that week and didn't leave anything on my plate, you, you know, so you can look back and say, all right, I, I know why I gained weight, or yeah, I did exactly what I was supposed to do and I lost weight. No, you're exactly right. If you're not assessing, you're just guessing. That, that goes part of that whole journey. <clears throat> Let's see. Here we go. Just rolled my ankle this weekend. Any advice? <laughs> I'm on your phase one program. Not sure how long to stay off. It swelled, but not bruised. Um, couldn't walk for the first day and a half. Well, <sighs> you know what? You're going to have to take it easy. You're, you're probably going to have to not run for a week and just replace with biking probably what i would do and i don't know if you've ever tried swimming with an ankle sprain but man it sucks um it's just flopping around there and it just it hurts really bad you can't wear fins with an ankle sprain that's even worse um so you may have to lay off swimming as well so tape it up if you want to try running Tape it up. Don't run on anything uneven. Maybe run on turf, something a little softer than concrete, and just run straight. Just run straight back and forth so you're not making any turns and making any slight twists or anything. You might still be able to run like that, but give it some time. If it's still swollen, don't run. 
make sure whenever you are on your feet, it is uh, wrapped with some kind of, you know, ace bandage or compression sleeve or something like that, just to give it some support. Um, Chuck roast recipe is awesome. Great job on the cooking posts. Uh, you know what? Those are just kind of fun for me. Um, I do the cooking in the house. So when kids grew growing up, we actually did that pot roast thing. We called it a snow roast. And uh, every time it snowed, I'd make that. We'd go play in the snow for a couple hours, come back and be ready. That was good stuff. But yeah, that whole series about cooking is really geared towards a couple of things. One, my son, who's living in college and has his first apartment and has never cooked for himself. So he didn't really watch me all summer when he was home about cooking. So now I have to create these kind of memes or videos of me cooking so he can apply some of that knowledge, you know, when he's there. Uh, but it's also been very helpful for all the other bachelors who've moved here to train with us. And, um, you know, they, uh, they tend to uh, need help in that area as well. So glad you're liking it. All right, here's a question on Instagram. Is six miles zone two and three CrossFit workouts five to six days a week too much? Um, six miles a week? That's not much at all. CrossFit workouts five to six days a week is pretty normal. I mean, it also depends on what's your goal. Do you want to be a CrossFit athlete and compete in those competitions? You probably need to do a little more. Um, if you're just trying to be fit, above average, that's, pr that's a pretty good way to do it. If you're trying to crush your PST, you probably need to focus on something else besides CrossFit because it's not necessarily PST specific. So depending on what your goals are, you need to get specific with those goals because you may be missing something. Um, am I in California, Vegas area? No, I'm in Maryland. You can email me, stew at stewsmith.com if you don't want to DM me. Stew at stewsmith.com, S-T-E-W. I see. During the underwater knot tying test, another question here. Um, are you always using one rope to tie the knot around another rope, or do you have something to use two ropes for knots? Um, no, you use one rope to tie onto another rope that's down on the bottom of the pool. It's stretched out tight on the bottom, so you're going to wrap your square knot, your Beckett's bin, your bowling, your right angle knot and your clove hitch to that rope. It's about, I think it's in the 15 foot section. So. Let's see another question. Pragmatic cooking to the point you get all your numbers in. There you go. Yeah. You know, I'm not fancy cooking. You know, every now and then I, I'd see people say, do this and do this. And I'm like, I have no idea what that spice is. You know, if it's not salt, pepper, and Lowry seasoning, I really don't know what it is. Um, all right. What do you recommend for a 58-year-old, 235 pounds after long absence from training, no knee problems, physical limitations? So that's good. And you're not super overweight. Uh, I've seen worse, you know, 300 plus. You know, in that range, that gets a little harder on the joints, just moving around. So 230 is doable. It's basically like a 200-pound guy carrying around a 35-pound backpack. Um, but you will be, you should treat yourself like a beginner. Just like when I started on this uh, podcast um, or live Q&A show, you know, just talk about what do you really need. You really just need to get moving. You know, and if walking hurts you by any for any reason, 
you know, do some non-impact cardio, get on a bike, you know, stationary bikes probably going to be a little safer for you, to be honest, you know, get on a stationary bike or walk on a treadmill. If you don't have a place to walk and just get religious with it. I mean, like every day you're going to walk anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 steps, right? That's, that's part one. And then you can start adding some calisthenics in it. You add some dumbbells in it. And it slowly evolves week after week to where now you start adding some weights. That's a good beginner progression into more advanced activities of fitness. Where a lot of people go wrong is they just start right in the weight training or they start running out of nowhere. And next thing you know, they're, they're sore as hell they can't move or they've injured themselves to a point where they just can't go back for a significant amount of time. And now they got to lay off two weeks of, you know, walking even because your foot hurts. So treat yourself like a beginner. I tell everybody that even if you're an advanced athlete who has taken, you know, maybe had surgery and you've had four months of not being able to do a certain activity, the last thing you're going to want to do is leave, you know, start off where you left off, whether that was a running program, a swimming program, lifting, calisthenics, whatever. Just treat yourself like a beginner for a few weeks. That's my number one rule. If you haven't done anything in a while, treat yourself like a beginner. Let's see what we got over here. Frederick, Maryland. Hey, hey. Some recruiters on here. I swear in Tuesday, appreciate your help in helping me prepare for spec war. If limited to only 25 meter pool, that's four feet deep. What's the best way to incorporate water con drills? You know, that's a tough one. My advice would be to practice um, kind of a horizontal tread, if it makes sense. If you think about what treading is, it's vertical swimming. So try to get a little diagonal, work on some egg beater while you're kind of swimming backwards you know, at that angle, um, you can practice, you know, scissor kick and glides. Um, but it's like a scissor kick left, scissor kick, right, scissor kick, left, scissor kick, right. Or you can try breaststroke kicks, you know, just practice, you know, you're treading and then other water con drills, you know, you're not going to be able to bob until you find some deeper water. Um, Uh, but you can definitely tread. You can do some underwaters, things like that. But yeah, you, you'll you'll be able to practice it. I, I mean, I've seen guys pass drown proofing tests and had only first time they ever even attempted it was two weeks before the test. So you'll have time to train. You can even do some weekend training. You know, whenever you're you find a pool and do practice some of those pool con events have you seen the new video seal swick youtube channel it's a css instructional video and they recommend tons of flutter kicks wanted your thoughts yes i have seen that and that is a way to swim i'm not knocking it if you want to spend your 500 yard swim doing over 500 flutter kicks go right ahead and I want you to see how it affects the rest of your performance in sit-ups because your hip flexors are jacked or the run at the end. My whole process of teaching has been conservation of energy in the swim so you can crush the other events. That means you want to make the swim as efficient as possible, not a gut check so you got nothing left and you spent all your glycogen in your body and blood sugar kicking for really no reason. And here's the reason why. The only people I have seen who kick well are people who spent hours of their day holding a kickboard like this and flutter kicking at swimming practice. People who are land athletes suck at two things, flutter kicking and breaststroke kicking. They just suck at it. That's why I teach scissor kick for all the land athletes. And if you've got a little bit of swimming background, you want to do a breaststroke kick with it. Great. Do a breaststroke kick it. But you don't need the extra flutter kicks. If you want to learn it that way, go right ahead. But 
you'll probably wind up realizing you're way tired at the back end of that to score like you normally do when you're fresh doing the PST. So my advice to you, if you want to see which one is better, and I'm happy to listen to whoever that is, because some people will be doing great with their flutter kicks because maybe they spent a lifetime flutter kicking. Some people won't. So to teach it universally like that, I don't agree with, but it is a way to do it depending on your athletic history. But do this. Take a PST, kick all you want. Flutter kick the hell out of that thing. Um, or, no, and take it again another day, maybe another week, and just kick once per stroke. Whether that's a scissor kick or a breaststroke kick, that's up to you. And see which one you do better in. You know, everybody's going to be a little bit different. So when I say there's a way to learn it, there's a way to learn it. I don't teach the only way to do the CSS. I just would not teach it that way. Do you consider making a book about these cooking ideas? Um, I have not, to be honest with you. I'll, I'll consider it, but um, I'm definitely not in the cookbook business. Um, uh, but I'm glad you like them. I'll keep doing them. Uh, what's the best way to get back into running after arthroscopic knee surgery? Just the way I said earlier to the beginner who hadn't done anything, treat yourself like a beginner. Start off with bikes, um, walking. Um, once you can get into swimming and do that. And, and by the way, this is all post physical therapy and you're cleared to run again. Right. So let me just start there. Don't even start running until your physical therapist says, all right, you're good to run. They'll probably give you some advice on how to run and how to progress. But I, my advice would be start off like a beginner um, runner again. Just maybe five miles a week, one mile a day. And build up 10 to 15 percent progression like that. It's going to take time, but you, you're going to have to be patient with injuries. And be patient with being a beginner, right? If you haven't done anything in a decade, you know, you didn't get out of shape overnight. You're not going to get in shape overnight either. So the last thing you want to do is start off where you left off. Let's see what we got over here. Conserving energy, best way to go, definitely. Now, I'm not knocking the way they teach the combat swimmer stroke. I've seen many people teach it that way. You got to remember, I've been doing this for over 25 years, helping people pass PSTs and get through spec ops training and police training and firefighter training. You know, I've seen what works and I've seen what does not work, right? Sometimes I will say this sometimes the worst advice a non swimmer can get is from a swimming coach. Sometimes the worst advice a non-running athlete can get is from a track coach because they are used to teaching swimmers who've been kicking all their life. They've been, they're used to teaching people who run 60, 70 miles a week on the cross country team. You know, they're not used to teaching someone who's deadlifts a truck and can run a hundred meters in 12 seconds. Right. And they think long distance is anything over 400 meters. Right. They're not used to teaching that kind of athlete. Um, so just remember a lot of this is going to depend on your athletic history as to how you navigate through these different fitness tests and even the selections themselves and how you you prepare for that let's see any tips for bulletproofing shoulders for selection um we do a couple of things um obviously overhead presses i have this one workout um called the lightweight shoulder workout i put it in just about all of my books now um, but it's also an article, 
In fact, if you Google, in fact, I'm Googling right now, lightweight shoulder workout, Stu Smith, and it pops up and it's, it's right there, lightweight shoulder circuit, five pounds or less. That's five pounds of dumbbell. That's as most weight you really need. Some people go seven and a half, maybe even 10, but I wouldn't go over 10. But it's a whole bunch of lateral raises, thumbs up, thumbs down, front raises, crossovers, uh, reverse flies, military press. Um, that's a really good little circuit. Uh, but then another one we like to do is a little bit heavier where you do like your bicep overhead presses combined together. And then on your 10th one, you hold it for a minute, right? So now you're just holding it there, overhead press, is isometric hold for one minute. And um, that works really well. You do that multiple sets spread throughout the workout. Um, and it, it's a good way to bulletproof your shoulders. But you could also Google that term. I'm sure somebody's written a clever article or made a neat video on YouTube on how to do it with bands. And, you know, so I, I would just diversify your shoulder activity because here's the unique thing about the shoulder. The shoulder is one of the most versatile joints we have. It is one left, down, push, up, throw. You know, it does so many different movements that you can do a variety of things to bulletproof your shoulders, all different planes. But here's the problem is that because of its versatility, it is really easy to injure. So just remember that, you know, you don't want to bulletproof so much that you hurt yourself. So how to improve mile and a half run. <sighs> Goal pace running. So I want you to Google the term Stu Smith goal pace running, All right? Because what I want you to do is get on a track, run a quarter mile, and whatever your goal is, let's say it's a, you want to run a nine minute mile and a half. Your goal is to hit that quarter at a nine minute mile and a half pace, which is a 130, 400. It's a three minute 800. It's a six minute mile. Now, if you're running a 15 minute mile and a half, that's not really a logical goal for you right now. You probably need to drop it down to a 12 minute mile and a half, then a 1030 mile and a half and go from a nine minute mile to an eight minute mile to a seven minute mile to a six minute mile, learning those paces along the way. So it really kind of depends. You know, there's no one answer for a question like, how to improve the mile and a half. That is an, um, that is one of those questions that requires more information. You know, how many miles a week are you running now? What's your athletic history? You know, so, you know, get on a running program and start working towards your goal. Start learning how to run faster and get in shape to run faster. Now, there's a couple of different articles out there. In fact, I wrote an article recently called Running Plan to Help You Get To and Through Selection. And it's only 20 miles a week, but you got to work your way up to 20 miles a week first. But then you'll see it has a variety of different workouts each day for you to do to get to that six minute pace to run a PST and that seven minute mile pace to run four mile timed runs. Or if you're in the army going ranger, five mile timed runs, you know, all of those are requirements of you to have to learn a six minute mile pace for a P PT test and a seven minute mile pace for four to five to six mile runs. Let's see couple of questions over here on YouTube. Um, I think I just answered that question. What should I do to get my five mile time to run down? Same thing. Goal pace running. Seven minute mile. Um, what are a few major things that not, all, not many BUDS candidates would know to train practice for before getting to BUDS? things that blindside most candidates, even most physically prepared. Um, 
I would say some of the most physically prepared people that I have seen go there and fail something was treading. That's number one. People always overlook treading as something that's easy, right? But let me tell you, if you're negative, you're pretty bulky, got some muscle mass on, not much body fat, treading sucks. I mean, if you can do push-ups on the bottom of the pool, bobbing's real easy for you, but treading is going to be a put-out evolution every single time. So as long as you know treading sucks, you should practice it until it doesn't suck anymore. And it will always suck to some degree, but at least you'll be in some kind of treading technique and condition. Um, in fact, I've written an article recently about treading and mobility. You can Google that, tread, treading, mobility, Stu Smith. Um, because a, a, a big link to unable to tread is pure mobility issues in the hips, knees, and ankles. Um, you work on that, you'll be able to tread a little bit better, get a better kick out of that. And uh, it won't be quite so sucky. Um, if you're shorter, uh, people have failed the obstacle course. If you're bigger, people have failed the obstacle course because of grip, right? They just didn't work their grip strength enough to climb ropes and hold on to monkey bars and climbing walls and things like that. So grip and treading are probably the first two. But the biggest things, to be honest with you, those are kind of minor. Um, not many people fail because of that, but there are a good amount of number. Where most of your failures are is failing four-mile timed runs every week and two-mile swims with fins every week. So <clears throat> those are the two biggest. And being cold. You know, you, you shouldn't like torture yourself in cold water, but it should not be a shock to you when you get cold and you're wet and sandy. You know, maybe even if you have a beach available to you, you jump in the water, you get uh, wet, you roll around on the sand, and then you go do a four mile run wet and sandy. You'll get a good feel for how it always feels at Bud's because I, I can think of about five days and six months that I was not wet and sandy. So I think that is probably the biggest things that get even the most physically prepared is just discomfort and those other elements. Okay, another question. Um, regarding the instructional video on the CSS by Navy SEALs official channel, they mentioned that you should push your arms forward with force in order to help you propel forward. What do you look, man? There's so many different ways to do this. You know, you should push your arms forward, but I mean, it's, it's a tight streamline on the recovery and then you pull to go forward. You know, I, Let's let's do, let's don't do this. Let's don't compare the way I teach and the way someone else's teach, right? You figure out which one you want to follow. I don't care, right? You can either do my method that I've been doing for 25 years or you can do somebody else's. Don't care. Right? My stuff's up there for free. I don't make a dime how you decide you want to swim. Right? You need to find what works best for you. Okay, Air Force guy, for the IFT, can you freestyle? Yeah, you should know this answer. I've been doing CSS a lot and was wondering if I should also practice freestyle for the IFT. Yeah. Freestyle is going to be faster for you, most likely. And most people know how to teach it well. So you can go take lessons on learning how to take the IFT. Not many people know how to teach the CSS. Some people have different ideas than I do. All right, let's see. Another question over here on Instagram. Some of you guys are answering other people's questions, which is great, but they take up my space. 
I'm stuck at 12 pull-ups. Any tips to getting to 16 to 18? Uh, yeah, you can do two ways. You can do pull-ups every other day and pick a hard workout like a pyramid, a superset, a max rep set. In fact, there's an article I wrote called Three Favorite Workouts to Crush Fitness Tests. I want you to Google that, right? That's option number one. And it's it's about it's a high volume workout. You're going to build yourself up to a, probably 100 pull ups every day, uh, three days a week. You got rest days in between. The other way, if you want to try it, 12, it will probably work pretty well for 12. You can do 10 straight days of pull ups. And what you do is you take your pull ups, multiply it by five. So that's what, 60. So you do 60 pull ups a day for 10 straight days. Now. If you're, and this is a supplemental plan. So you got a normal workout plan. Let's say your pull up on a Monday, you're doing 100 pull ups on the, that counts. You don't have to add 60 pull ups to that. That counts as your pull up day. But on a day that you're not doing pull ups, like a leg day or a cardio day, you add 60 pull ups to that day. And you, for 10 days straight, you've done 10 straight days of pull ups. Then you take three days off and you rest. Um, no pulling, right? You can still push, you can still run, you can still swim, all that stuff. No pull-ups, no pull-downs, no rows, no pulling exercise. Rest those pulling muscles for three days. Then on day 14, you test pull-ups and see what happens. There's an article that I wrote for your option two. If you type in Stu Smith protocol, in fact, let me try that. Stu Smith protocol. What should pop up is a free two-week protocol for pull-ups, push-ups, and sit-ups. So you can do it for all three. I don't necessarily recommend doing all three at the same time. because That's a lot of extra reps in your day. But you can read the article, how it's set up. There's a little chart on day one, how you do it, day two, how you do it all the way up to day 10 and then resting. So it's called two-week free, free two-week protocol for pull-ups, push-ups, and now sit-ups. And that's over on stewsmithfitness.com. The other one is also on stewsmithfitness.com. You either go to that website and search it in the search feature, or you can go to Google and type in those words. Three favorite workouts to crush fitness tests or free two-week protocol. Hmm. Let's see. Other questions. All right. You guys got to quit answering each other <laughs> if you want me to answer because it's just taking up time finding questions. Uh, any tips for getting better at running boat? Uh, rucking in sand or hills is what I would suggest. And if you don't have any of those, here's what I recommend. Go to a gym and find a stair stepper. Put on a weight vest and do a stair stepping workout with a weight vest on. That sucks. Um, now, I know that's not going to be getting your head and neck prepared for it, but you can always do, um, you know, neck exercises. Um, in fact, there's a uh, there's an article I wrote again, uh, building neck strength for running boats, easy supplemental, no extra credit, build neck durability, as simple as saying yes and no, and side to side. That means yes, no, side to side, laying down and on your belly. It's that simple. Your melon weighs about, I don't know, 10 pounds. It's a great, it's a great weight for your neck muscles. You just got to work it. So. That is what I do. I would work your neck muscles. I do two things. Run with a ruck on the soft sand beach and um, work your neck. If you don't have a beach, get a backpack and, or a weight vest and get on a stair stepper. Both are articles, right? In fact, you can Google um, stair stepper, spec ops. Weight best stair step workout. Put my name in it. You'll see it. For those looking to join Spec Ops, weighted stair steps are a useful tool. 
Check out that article. What heart rate do you see your guys at doing the 1.5 mile run? Well, it depends. You know, some guys can cruise in at a nine minute mile and a half and be probably still aerobic, right? Some decide, hey, I'm going to put all out and see if I can go eight minute mile and a half. And then they're probably near their max heart rate. So it really kind of depends. So I, I would suggest having two timed run. One where it's a gut check and just see what you can do in a mile and a half putting out. And then the other one saying, all right, let's see if I can keep my heart rate down and still get a nine, 930. Right. See if you can run your pace and keep your heart rate down. One thing that will help you with that is not having pre-workout or caffeine. You know, if you're really trying to stay aerobic and not go anaerobic too soon, you want to lay off the caffeine before any type of running cardio uh, PST workout because it, it's not helpful for that. It, it will get you anaerobic before you're even running a quarter mile. If, if you're not used to, you know, caffeine doing that to you, you know, some people have different tolerances to caffeine and can handle it, but I don't recommend it. It's not a performance enhancer for PSTs. So a lot of that depends, depends on your effort and depends on your aerobic base. You know, can you run a seven minute mile without, you know, by being a zone two? That's a good thing to try to get up to, you know, and be nice and nice, steady heart rate, seven minute mile. Then that makes your six minute mile maybe a little bit anaerobic, might go 150, 160 versus being at 190. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on stretching at buds? Are you... Are there specific stretches that I did? I stretched my ass off at Bud's. Um, I wish I'd have thought of two things. I wish I'd have thought of a foam roller. Back in the early 90s, there was no foam rollers. And using, I actually had a car buffer that I used to wax my truck. Um, and I wish I'd have used that as a massage tool. So um, those things are great. Uh, I, I love both of them, um, but stretching, absolutely. Major muscle groups, primarily, you know, hamstrings, thighs, calves, shins, uh, glutes, lower back, you know, chest, shoulders, definitely need to stretch those, you know, especially with all the push-ups, just loosening them up a little bit. But yeah, stretching is key. I thought. Let's see. <laughs> How will the government shut down buds and so as notifications? Um, I don't think it will will matter for that. I don't think the military is is affected too much by it. It's uh, mainly civilian government. Hopefully that won't last long. It's always stupid when they do this. No one wins those things. It's just people making political points. Um, does adding six flutter kicks during the glide phase of the CSS increase speed? Well, why don't you tell me? Why don't you take a 500-yard test, add six kicks per stroke to your kick, and see how you do? You know, one, I'd be surprised you can handle it for long. Two, um, you're just going to get winded sooner and you won't be able to maintain the pace that you're, you've are you been setting for yourself. So, yeah, your first hundred will probably be faster, but I guarantee you everything's going to get slower at some point, depending on your conditioning. So six flutter kicks per stroke is literally doing all right tell me this 
All right, that's probably going to put you up at like 600 flutter kicks in a 500-yard swim. Why? You know, whenever you could do it with one kick per stroke and actually do a length of 25 and 6, a lap and 12 times 10, now you got 120 kicks. So tell me which one's going to make your legs feel better, 120 kicks or 600 flutter kicks you know instead of taking my word for it test it you tell me i want all you guys to go test your six flutter kick css and let me know how you do are you faster great keep it up you know how did that affect your run and the other events that's also what i want to know because it's not just about swimming it's about the whole pst now we'll say this if you are preparing to swim with fins, all those flutter kicks, exactly what you want to do when you're swimming with fins. So depending on the context of teaching constant flutter kicks, you know, if you're doing it with fins, you're going to do constant flutter kicks. So will that be helpful in that transition? Absolutely. Do you advocate any particular diet for an older weight guy? You know what, Robert? It really kind of depends. Um, it really it depends on your your weight. Um, it depends on some of your sensitivities to food. Um, you know, for most overweight guys, if they can just reduce the sugar in their world, that is enough to help them. A lot of overweight guys just overeat. So it is just as much as about portion control as it is about a particular diet where you restrict this or you do more of this. You know, that gets a little hard. How about trying this? Why don't you try uh, putting your salad on a dinner plate and putting your dinner on a salad plate and see what that does? Because that is portion control made simple right there. See what happens. Give it a month and see what happens. You may find that after a salad, dinner size salad plate, you may not even want to eat a whole lot of the, the other parts of your, your meal because it's pretty filling. So that's where I would start. Try the salad plate, dinner plate switcheroo. In fact, that's what I'm going to call it. Is there anything I can do to, other than swim more to help my shins and ankles with stress from fins during distance? Um, also work on ankle mobility. In fact, there's an article that I mentioned earlier about treading and mobility. Ankle mobility swimming with fins is very important because if you don't have that zero degree angle between your shin and your foot right basically a ballerina point if you're if your ankle's like this you know it's it's always like your top of your foot and your shin always make an angle your ankles aren't mobile enough to handle the stress of fins because that fin's going to put a lot of torque on that ankle and it's going to take it the other way so <clears throat> you really want ankle mobility look up some ballerina ankle stretches right but you should be able to have a ballerina's point um by just lifting your leg up and pointing it right it should have a zero degree angle right across that top in fact if you check out that article mobility and treading there's a picture of me sitting on my shins and what that should look like so i'm sitting on my heels but my shins are flat on the ground and my uh my feet are flat on the ground as well. There's no sky or sunlight going underneath my my shin and ankle joint. So that that is another tool for building ankle mobility. So that's that's what it is. It's ankle mobility for you. And yes, you got to get used to it. All right, let's see what else we got here. Do you know the best way to prevent cramping during long evolutions or days when you do a lot of volume with 
not a lot of stretching, hell week. You can stretch during hell week. You can hydrate during hell week. You can eat every six hours during hell week. Um, yeah, you just got to stay hydrated and keep the electrolytes flowing. You know, that, that's probably the biggest thing. But only add electrolytes if you're sweating. Or if it's arid out, as I say, because over here on the East Coast, you sweat when it's hot. It's just humid, right? But in the desert, or if you're in arid climates, you won't sweat. You sweat, and then it evaporates, so you don't have any wetness on you, but you will see salt stains. So anytime you see salt stains, you definitely need to add in some sodium because you're losing it. So every meal you have, put salt on stuff. Um, if, you, if they give you Gatorade, drink it uh, or whatever electrolyte um, uh, drink that they're adding, probably drip drop, you know, liquid IV, something like that. You definitely need to add that in there because that, that's going to matter. There's two things that really matter when you've got long days. That is nutrition and your hydration, right? Because if you run out of energy, um, or you become a heat casualty because you're dehydrated, you're done. But if you run out of energy, you're done as well. You're going to have to really be dragging your ass until you can eat again. So you need to be eating quite regularly. So. Let's see. So when every time you get an opportunity to eat, eat. Even on a full belly, you know you're about to go run. You need that food. You need that food to stay warm. You need that food for energy. Is there anything I can do other than, so, oh, did that one. I'm getting much, I'm not getting much glide distance after kicking. My momentum stops, even though I'm in a streamlined position. What would you recommend for producing stronger kick? Yeah, you know, there is this thing about kicking harder, right? You need to open and close your legs in a way that, produces more power and a lot of people think it's a big leg spread and it's from your hips it's actually you don't have to spread your legs that much at the hips it's from the knees down and you whip kick those knees down whether that's a tight flutter kick from the knees down and or a breaststroke kick from the knees down it is a hard whip kick so start practicing just kicking a little harder you may want to warm up a little bit before you start really hard kicking because I've seen a lot of people, you know, pull adductor muscles and things like that with these kicks or maybe even hamstrings, depending on how hard they're kicking. So, um, yeah, that's what I would do. Get a kickboard too. work the kickboard drill. In fact, there's an article I wrote once again called uh, CSS Help Fix Your Kick. I want you to Google that. CSS help fix your kick. That should help you. What scenario would you incorporate ice baths? Um, you know, ice baths are pretty popular. It's another addition to recovery. If you want to add it, add it. I have no problems with it. I never did it. I have done it. Um, you know, I, I put it this way. Probably 90% of your recovery is going to come from your sleeping and your nutrition. That 10%, actually, if you do it right, 100% can come from sleeping and nutrition, right? But life isn't always great, and we're not always eating the best. We're not always sleeping the best. So you might have this missing 10% that you might be able to help yourself find through a variety of sources, whether that's ice, compression, um, uh, massage, foam rollers, stretching, mobility work. What else is there? Massage tools. You know, all of those little things can might add some recovery to you. Might make you feel a little better. Those are great, right? If they make you feel better, that's great. Do it. Um, but as far as any type of situation where it's needed, I would say, once again, it is personal preference. SWAT tryouts in November. What should my week of tryout look like? Uh, week before your tryouts? I would probably say, you know, you don't want to rest completely. I would say keep your cardio up. 
run a little bit, do some mobility days in there. And um, I think you'll be fine. In fact, I have some uh, taper articles that you could find. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. I, I would say add a mobility day, you know, a couple of days before your actual um, tryout start. That way you're well rested, but you're not doing nothing. You know, you're working some mobility, you're working a little bit of cardio, your muscles are moving. So you want to be well rested. You want to be fed well. You want to be have a good night's sleep. You know, all of those things are really critical to your recovery that week and how you perform on that day one of tryouts. What would you say is the biggest difference between Air Force A and S and phase one of BUDS of a physical output point of view? Um, I think they're very similar. Um, a lot of water confidence, a lot of running. There's boats, there's logs in both. It's pretty similar. That Air Force is no joke. Special Air Force Special Warfare is no joke. What was I doing to train a year before you left for buds? <sighs> um, I was playing rugby in college for the first six months of that. And then I didn't play rugby the last six months because I was ankle sprains and stitches and probably a concussion that first six months. Um, but yeah, I was working out i'd go run and pt in the morning before school then go to rugby practice and then after rugby practice i would go back um and swim and then i would study so my days were pretty busy prior to buds uh but yeah a lot of running a lot of calisthenics i didn't lift any weights because of my athletic history i didn't need to I came into this journey pretty strong as a football power lifter type. So I literally just ran, biked, swam, and did calisthenics for that full year. And never once wished I had lifted weights while I was at Bud's. But that was my, once again, that was my athletic history. I was pretty strong. Didn't need to get stronger. I didn't need to double down on my strength. I need to double down on my weakness, which was running and swimming and high rep calisthenics. And that's what I did. What's my favorite non-impact cardio machine purely to improve cardio? Uh, my personal is bike. I would say I bike more than any other non-impact cardio, but I also do elliptical and also row a machine every now and then. But I'd say my favorite is the bike, for sure. I would rather swim, but if I just need to stay dry because I already swam that day, um, I'll get on a bike if I don't feel like running. All right, let's see. Couple more questions. Damn, we've been at this for an hour. Huh. Couple more questions and I got to go. You guys have uh, been asking some good questions today. Hey, Stu, I'm sub nine for the swim and run, sub 28 for the four mile. Been bear crawling a ton, lifting every day, fending three times a week. What do you think I should? I think you're ready to talk to your recruiter now. I think those are great scores. You won't be wasting any time failing PSTs, that's for sure. So, yeah, as soon as you're ready to ship, get on out there. With those scores like that, I think that's great. Potassium chloride will help prevent cramping. There you go. Um, how many hours were you able to sleep at night in first phase? Uh, not many, but I was kind of used to it. You know, I was going through college at the Naval Academy. We were probably five to six a night anyway. Um, so it, it was somewhere in that range, five to six a night, but then you get weekends off at bud. So those, that's where you kind of made up. You slept in on Sunday and Saturday and it was good stuff. 
All right, so uh, I'm going to start signing off over here on uh, Instagram. Thanks for sticking around, you guys. I know I missed some um, um, missed some questions there. If you want to resend them, you can send them over to me at stew at stewsmith.com. Uh, happy to answer them. Um, but if you want to watch this again, you can see it over on my YouTube channel. Um, and you can see the questions answered up there as well. So I, I do these every day, 930. Sorry, every Monday and Tuesday, 930 a.m. And um, take live questions over here. So I'm not always on Instagram, though. So I'm always on my YouTube channel on Monday and Tuesdays. All right. So I'll catch you guys later, Instagram. So you guys uh, that are over here on um youtube i'm still on here for a few more minutes um it was just getting a little bit cluttered over there so just wanted to finish off over here um uh, looks like i got two more questions what are your major tips for success in college and going back after getting out of the air force it's a big adjustment you know what it's all about time management so get yourself set up on a habit of fitting in something in your day so for me I would work out before school. I was always a morning workout guy, so that made me feel good. I was awake. I could stand some morning workout or do my morning workout, and then I'd just be probably at my best in the morning for just being paying attention. Then, you know, break for lunch, afternoon classes for a couple hours, not my best time, but muddled through it. And then in the afternoons, you know, if you're on a sports team, you do sports, but if you're not, just start your workout in the afternoon, get it over with, go study in the evening and, you know, call it a day. But you're going to have to do the juggling and figure out what's what's best for you, you know, how much you're really needing to train. Because you may need to go more academic some, some semesters versus training that much. And you're just in a maintenance phase of training, which may only require you to work out for half an hour in the morning just to wake up. And then you spend the rest of your day focusing on juggling school, study, and work, depending if you're adding in work. So that's what I would do, sir. Good luck getting back. I think it should be fun for you as well. At Bud's, during any phase, are you able to find hot tub to soak? Uh, there, yeah, We did some hot tub soaking. You know, some guys out in town had some. Um, you always had friends in other phases that, might have rented a house that had one. I'm trying to think if there's a public one somewhere. I don't remember. But there were a couple of uh, um, a couple hot tub days for sure. Especially after Hell Week. I found a hot tub and that was nice. Because I had so much chafing and sand stuck in scabs that I just needed to soak. And that felt actually pretty good. All right. Well, this went pretty well. So I appreciate your time and listening. Uh, if you guys have, um, you know, any questions that I missed, um, you can or secondary questions, email me stew at stewsmith.com. If I said, you know, go Google this and you can't find it, just email me. I'll send you the link. Uh, but check out stewsmithfitness.com. Most of those articles are written there, and you can um, you can check them out. Um, you know, in the article section, you know, there's, there's a search feature there, but also, you know, if you are shopping over there, use live one five, say 15% on your books and eBooks. I appreciate your time. You guys have a good one. I'll be back tomorrow.